Well, while you're standing, let's read God's word this morning. We're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. If you have God's cop- uh, your copy of God's word, uh, take it out and get to the book of Luke. If not, we've got the cheater on the screen for you this morning. It reads like this. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. He will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though, he will not rise and give to him because he is a friend. Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as he needs. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord that in this short parable you teach us so much about prayer. God, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you'd move in this place today, that you would awaken us to a deeper prayer life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and amen. You may be seated. Well, I was talking with Pastor Ross yesterday. He's been with Convoy of Hope. If you don't know what Convoy of Hope is, it is an organization affiliated with the Assemblies of God that is a first respond organization to disaster relief efforts. So they are first boots on the ground in some of the major disasters we've seen over the last couple of years. And uh, we have a great relationship with them. So Pastor has been on a mission with them and he is, uh, he is ready to get back to see you guys. He tell, he tell, tell the church that I'm ready to see them. So Church, our pastor is, is ready to see your faces again, and he'll be with us uh, soon. We have a great pastor, don't we? I love Pastor Ross. Can we just show him some honor this morning? And I'm so thankful that he gave me this opportunity to share with you today as we continue our sermon series, Jesus Uncensored. I want to talk around the idea of a friend uh, coming at midnight or showing up at midnight. Do you have those people in your life that if they called you at midnight, you would answer? And then you have those people in your life that if they called you ever, you would screen it every time. <laughs> it seems like I am the friend that gets screened more than I am the friend that gets answered. So maybe there's something I need to work on in my own life. So Jesus tells this parable, and it, it's an interesting parable. It's kind of a humorous parable about a, a guy going to his friend's house at midnight and asking for some bread and and getting the bread, not because he has a good friend, but because he was just annoying. And Jesus says, this is how you should, this is how you should approach God in prayer. And oftentimes when you read these parables and these stories, you got to take a step back and look at the full context of what Jesus is saying. Because if we don't do this, we can get into the thought pattern that Jesus is telling us that God is like a vending machine. That if you just put the right amount of money in, you can push the right buttons and get exactly what you want. I want you to know that Jesus didn't say that if you persist, that you get what you want from God. He said that if you persist, you get what you need from God. Those are two very different thoughts, aren't they? Now, I know some of you have been up to a vending machine and you've put your money in before and you hit the button and the Twix got stuck. You walk away from that vending machine just thinking maybe that was for somebody else, right? No way. What do you do? You pick the machine up, you throw it down, you take a, tri- a Twix and a bag of chips. I mean, that's what you get out of it. So God is not a vending machine that we can approach and just get whatever we want from him. And if I want it and, and I ask for it enough, then God's going to move his hand and, and give me what I want. That's not what Jesus is saying. So let's do that real quickly. Let's take a look and see uh, what was going on here that led Jesus to tell this story. It says in Luke chapter 11 verse 1 that it came to pass as Jesus was praying in a certain place that when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now have you ever been around somebody that is just a phenomenal prayer? You know, you get around them and you're like, golly, if I could pray like her, I think that I would get a little bit more prayers answered. If I could pray like him, I'm telling you what, heaven would move on my behalf. We have a pastor on staff, Pastor Angel. 
when this brother prays, I'm telling you, I don't know if this is possible, but I rededicate my heart three times and get filled with the Holy Spirit every time that he prays. Because this, he just knows how to pray. And every time he prays, I'm motivated to pray a little bit differently. And so this is what's going on is that Jesus is praying in a place and his disciples are watching him interact with God and they're going, this is different than what we're used to. Like, we don't interact with God the way that Jesus interacts with God and and we want that. We want to go deeper in, in how we connect with God. And they're like, Jesus, give us something. Make a deposit into us and teach us how to pray. Like, whatever you're doing seems to be working all right. And Jesus says, okay, let me teach you how to pray. And, and he goes on to teach them what we would call the Lord's Prayer. And he's not telling them that, the, that you should When he says, you should pray like this, he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins so that we also can forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's also found in Matthew. And Jesus isn't saying, every time you pray, repeat these words. That's not what he's saying to us here. But he's giving us a model or a behavior in which we can approach God and pray differently. You see, in the culture that the disciples were in, they had a routine in which they were allowed to pray. A part of the Jewish system, they would go to the temple and they would pray, they would, they would go to the priests and the priests would advocate and, and make sacrifices on their behalf and, and they had, uh, they had uh, feasts and tabernacles that would, that would systemize their relationship with God. And so they knew the routine of prayer. And that's why it was disconnected from the way Jesus prayed. Because Jesus didn't pray in the typical routine of prayer. But Jesus prayed in a relational atmosphere of prayer. And the disciples were uh, curious about what it took to get that type of prayer life. And Jesus is saying, well, first, you got to see prayer differently. You don't see it as a routine or a systematic behavior that you're supposed to be about. But you should start your prayers like this. Our Father. You access God differently in prayer when you approach him as Father than when you do approach him as a distant being that is in heaven that will smite you if you don't act the right way. Some of us may be still caught into the routine of Approaching God as a distant deity figure that maybe we've disappointed at some area in our life and and that's hindered our prayer relationship. And I want to let you know today that Jesus' own word says that you don't have to approach God in your failure, but you can approach him as father regardless of your failure. And that will enhance your prayer life. And that's where the disciples were at. and, and, And so Jesus is teaching them how to pray. Could you imagine when he says, pray this, that your will would be done, God, on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know how God's will is done in heaven? Immediately and without question. Now let me ask you, when God gives you a directive in your life, is it immediate and without question? Because I can tell you in my life, it's delayed and with a lot of negotiation. You know what I mean? Like, you're supposed to forgive your wife for talking that way. I don't want to. I'm not going to forgive her today, Lord. It's in your hands. You forgive her. Okay? You know what I mean? Like, hey, uh, you should uh, not act like this anymore because you're a different person now. I don't know. I don't know, God. Like, I still think I could act like this and praise God for forgiveness later. You know what I'm talking about? See, in heaven, his will is done without negotiation or delay. It's done immediately. And so imagine the power of that prayer. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's how I know that Jesus isn't talking about this want approach to prayer with God. Like, God, I need a new boat. And he's like, you don't need a new boat. You would like a new boat, uh, but I'm not going to just give you a new boat. He's like, but, I, I, but God, I really want, I really want that, that brand new Maserati, I just need it, Lord. If I had that Maserati, God, our, our, your ministry could go deeper and faster. Like we could get the gospel faster to people. 
God, if you could give me that new Tesla paid off, Lord, I would be a good steward with the environment that you've given us because it's electric. Like, I need it, God. He's like, no, no, that's not what this is about. It's about my will being done, Cody, on earth as it is in heaven. See, the angels don't get to negotiate with me. They just got to go do it. So when I tell them to go tell this little girl that has never known a man that she's going to have my son, they do it, and they don't talk to me about how uncomfortable it's going to be. So when, Cody, when I ask you to go witness to that guy on the street corner, you better do it. And I'm like, I don't, I'm not going to pray that prayer anymore. Lord, let your will be done in somebody else's life as it is in heaven. And I begin to, you know what I'm talking about? I'm like, I'm not going to go witness to this person. What am I going to go do? I'm going to buy him a Chick-fil-A card. $10 at Chick-fil-A goes a long way, and it's the Christian chicken anyway. <laughs> Man, that meal is pre-blessed. You don't even have to worry about it. And so that, bro, I'm going to give that guy the card. He's going to go into Chick-fil-A, the Christian chicken. It's pre-blessed food. And they got worship music playing. And there's going to be somebody behind the counter that is trained and ready to ask this person whatever their needs are and tell them, hey, I'm going to get you your food and I'll give you Jesus too. God, I don't want to witness to him. I want to empower Chick-fil-A to witness to him. No, he says, thy will be done. My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus is flipping the script on prayer for these guys. And then he gets into this parable, this story. I want you to see in this story what Jesus says at the very first, and it's really important. He says to them, which of you have a friend that if you have a need at midnight, you can go to them? This is about prayer, right? He doesn't say that this guy had a neighbor or a friend show up and he needed to, to give him three loaves of bread. So he, he went to his next door neighbor's house and he knocked on the door. No, when the need came at the most inappropriate or inopportune time, what does the guy in the parable do? He goes, i got to get to my friend's house. Because if I can get to my friend's house, I know that he's going to answer the door. He's telling us that God is a friend that we can always count on. This is Jesus' own words. He's saying that when you have a need that comes out of nowhere, you don't have to approach God like a stranger to meet that need, but you can show up to his door as a friend, and he will help you meet that need. Somebody in the room is feeling lonely today, like you don't have friends, and I'm here to tell you that you have a friend that will stick closer than a brother, that you can call on him in any time of need, and he will be faithful to show up regardless of the time. Have you noticed that life's biggest trials are always at the most inopportune times? You know when you're driving to church and the tire blows out on you? And now you have to work on your patience, your joy, your peace, your self-control. What are the other ones? You have to work on all of them. Or there's a little bit more month than there is money sometimes. I mean, our needs, they just, they just kick up at the most inopportune times. Are, are there those kids in our life that, man, we've had them in church and, and we've told them about Jesus, but now they're making rebellious decisions that are contrary to the word of God. And we, 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 we've spent time developing them and now we have a need. Or maybe our marriage got onto a, a, a rocky path and, and we don't know what's going to happen with it and it wasn't, it wasn't what we planned. This guy didn't plan for a guy to show up at midnight. I went to uh, Branson, Missouri at Christmas time and we left late because we had church. We don't miss church. We went on vacation after church. That's just what we did. And we got there and it was 11.59 Christmas Eve. Somebody was in our cabin. And I'm like, what are we going to do? We're sleeping in the car. And I was like, no, you're not. Knock on the door. I'm like, babe, it is 11.59 on Christmas Eve. They're going to think I'm either a, a robber or Santa Claus. And I've been working out. I'm not looking like Santa Claus today, babe. I'm not going to. So I call the guy that we rented from. And I'm like, hey, there's somebody in our cabin right now. And he's like, go knock on the door. I'm like, this isn't my cabin. 
you knock on the door. He's like, I'm in Oklahoma. We got an issue then. Give me another cabin. He's like, I, they're all booked. I'm like, well, you know what? You just bought the most expensive hotel room in your life because I'm going to get a five-star hotel. I'm getting the president's suite, and I'm sending you the bill, buddy. No, I didn't do that. I knocked on the door. <laughs> you, I'm telling you, at midnight, you're not expecting a knock. And I, I, hear in the, I hear in the living room the kids yell, Santa's here. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I got to tell them they got to move out of this house. Like, this is the worst eviction notice they've ever received. It turned out to be okay. We let them stay there. They just uh, sent the wrong reservation number, and so we had to go stay in, in their cabin. And so it all worked out. But I'm telling you, it was uncomfortable for them to receive a knock at midnight and for me to knock at midnight. And sometimes when our needs come unexpectedly, it feels uncomfortable to ask God to meet those needs. Because sometimes maybe our needs have been because of our own irresponsibility and our own actions. And I'm going to let you know something today, that God's grace can cover a multitude of irresponsible actions. But we have to approach him like a friend and ask him to help meet our needs. And listen, he'll be faithful and just to do that every time. So why was this guy so effective at knocking on the door? is because he assumed relational privilege, didn't he? He assumed that he could knock on the door. You see, when, when we approach God as friend, it allows our prayer life to grow in a boldness that we have never had before. We begin to approach God like a friend. We begin to ask God for things that we really need, like really big things, and God's like, hey, if you need it, I'm gonna meet it every time. I'm going to tell you a story now, and I have to disclaim this story because the people were a little nervous about me telling this story last night. But you have to understand two things. One, I tell this story when I lived in a different world or a different time. And I tell this story, we lived in a town that was really small. And my dad was at one of the largest churches. And so our family was known in the community of a really small town. So, now that you know the disclaimers... My first job ever at seven years old, let, let me tell you, the town was like Mayberry. Do you know Mayberry? Andy Griffith? Literally. I think we had one sheriff, maybe. We definitely had a couple Barney Fifes. <laughs> so my first job ever at seven years old, I was a paper boy. Yeah, come on somebody. Yeah. And my dad didn't say, he was like, okay, that's good. We got you a job. Now I'm going to teach you some stuff about customer service. My sister and my mom had a paper out. Now I have a paper out. And see, they got to roll their papers up real tight and rubber band them as much as they could. No, 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 no. not on our paper out. Our paper out, you got two folds and one rubber band so that you didn't have any crease marks. Okay, customer service. Their paper out, my sister could lean out the window. Different time, folks. Don't judge my parents, just what it was. She grabbed the handle, leaned out the window, and threw the papers. Oh, my mom's going to kill me. <laughs> Not our paper out. Our paper out, we'd pull up to the door. We'd run. I would run out. When I say we, my dad didn't do it. I would run out, and I would put the paper on the porch right by the front door so they'd have to go look for it. So, and then that was at the time where you had to collect for the newspaper. You know what I'm talking about? You had to go door to door and ask Asked the, for them to pay two twenty five for the week. If you had the if you have the weekend because of the coupons, it went up to six twenty five, because those coupons saved you a lot of money. And so I had to go and I had to collect in this neighborhood. Now, for a year, I didn't know this was happening, but my dad was going around introducing himself, letting them know that I would be in the neighborhood, and and. Uh, telling them his name and his contact information so that, so that I would have an easier way in the neighborhood. Now, I didn't know that was going on. So when they sent me into this neighborhood at eight or nine years old on my own, on my bike with leather bags full of paper, just riding, porching papers, I didn't know that my dad had already done pre-work so that I could have the free reign of this neighborhood. There was a guy on the neighborhood, and I, I could have sworn to you he was 104 because he just looked old to me. But I was seven or eight, so he was probably maybe in his 60s or 70s. Um, but I just, he just looked like 104. And we would collect, and it was 225 because he didn't want the weekend papers because he, he didn't trust the government to give him the right deal anyway. So anyway, 
So I go collect on his house one day. It's two twenty-five. He gives me uh, two fifty. He gives me five dollars. Tells me to keep the change. I'm telling you, eight years old, you get two fifty tip. That's my best friend. I don't care if he's one hundred and four or not. He's my best friend. And then he would invite me into his house every time I would go and purchase paper. He'd say, "Come in," and he'd have a Pepsi for me. This is where people get a little freaked out. I would go in. I would be. I would drink the Pepsi. They didn't even drink Pepsi. They drank Diet Pepsi, but they got me the real stuff. No formaldehyde in my Pepsi. I got the sugar. And he had a straw ready for me. And I'd sit, I'd talk with him, I'd ask him a lot of questions. And he told me this. He said, Cody, if I'm ever not on the front porch waiting for you, I want to have our conversation. I want you to come into my house, and I want you to find me. And we'll drink a Pepsi together, and we'll talk. I'm telling you, I did it every time. Why? Because I get a Pepsi out of the deal. Now, there's some people in the room, you're judging me right now and my parents for their parenting for letting me go into this strange guy's house. But remember, my dad had already built relationship with these people, so it gave me the relational privilege to enter in in a boldness that I didn't even know somebody already did the work for me. This is how it is with prayer for us is that if you are a blood-bought saint of the living God and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you approach God with a different name than you did before that moment. And you go in on a relational privilege of somebody else's work already done so that you and I can have a boldness to ask God for whatever we need because he'll do it for us. So he has a boldness. So it's midnight, he's like, Hey, buddy, I need some bread. Now, Jesus tells us in the story that this guy had uh, a house that was probably one bedroom because all of his kids were together in one room. And how that would work in that culture, if you weren't rich enough to have multiple bedrooms, you would put all the kids in the middle, and the dad and the mom would sleep on the back wall. And to get to the door, they'd have to walk through the kids to answer the door. So this guy's like knocking at midnight, and you know the, guy, the, the homeowner's checking his phone. He's probably on Facebook, you know, he's checking his phone. He's like, who is knocking at midnight? What in the world? Is, he's like, hey, it's me, it's Joe, I need, I need some bread. He's like, Joe, what are you doing, man? It's midnight, my kids are asleep. My wife's going to kill me if you wake them up. They don't ever sleep. Right? He's like... And this is what Jesus is making the point of. It's not that he didn't have the bread to give. It's that it wasn't the right time to give bread. It was an inopportune time. It was disrupting the things that were naturally supposed to be going on. And I'm telling you, it says that that he's going to get the bread, not because he's a good friend, but because the guy just wouldn't stop knocking Because as soon as he heard, you're going to wake up the kids, in negotiation, that's called the black swan. That is information you need to leverage what you want to get what you want. Now he knows if I keep knocking, they're going to wake the kids up, and this guy's going to have to give me the breath. So what am I going to do? Hey! I need the bread. Shh. No. Give me the bread. The guy's like, okay. How much bread do you need? Five loaves? Ten loaves? A hundred loaves? Just shut up! If you have little kids, I'm sorry that I had to get to that level. But could you imagine? And Jesus is saying, this is the attitude. This is the attitude I want you to approach God with in prayer. It's not that we can bend the will of God, but sometimes maybe God is trying to do something deeper in our life than just giving us the need immediately. Maybe he's trying to work out a character issue of patience in our life or, or seeing how much we want to persist to, if we really need this thing or not. Somebody tweeted the other day, if all of your prayers over the last 30 days were answered, how bigger would the kingdom of God be? So why wouldn't God delay some of those answers to see if you really wanted what you were getting, what you were asking for? He's saying, you got to keep knocking. you got to 
keep going. you got to knock on that door until your knuckles hurt. And you're saying, God, please, please, please help my kids. And he's like, let me see your knees right now. Let me see how worn out those, those jeans are because I want you to get something out of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring your kids back to you, but we got to get on our knees and in our prayer closet. And we are got to tell our kids that you might be rebellious now, but I'm going to pray you back in to the kingdom of God because I need salvation in my house. He's talking about a persistent attitude. And the word that is translated persistent there is really shameless. That we can approach God with a shameless attitude. Do you know that shame lies to us? Shame lies to us all of the time. Shame says maybe you're not asking the right way or maybe that healing that you asked for wasn't God's will. Did you know that God sent his son on the cross to die for our sins and to give us healing. Listen, y'all, if it wasn't his will, he wouldn't have gone to such extreme measures to make sure it was available. And so he's saying, I want you to approach me with a shameless persistence. What would our prayer life look like? How would it be enhanced if we approach God with a, a shameless persistence? You know, the enemy tries to put shame on us all of the time. He tries to say that that prayer is too selfish or, or God didn't answer that prayer yet and so he's not going to even listen to you. Or, or he says that you've made too many mistakes for God to even care about your prayer. He says, it's too late. It's midnight. Why would you ask? And Jesus is saying, I want you to knock on that door until it hurts. And you knock on that door some more. And you knock on that door until you knock on the door until it opens. And I'm wondering how many prayers go unanswered, not because God doesn't answer, but because we stop knocking. Maybe we get a little tired. Maybe our knuckles start to get a little red. And I hit that door about eight times and my hand is burning right now. I don't want to hit it anymore. And I tell you what, in my prayer life, there's some things that happen that I get like that. I kind of give up on it a little bit. I tell the story about Deborah and I, when we got married, we had uh, an unsurmountable amount of student loan debt that was just in our face all the time. And about five years into that, I was like, I'm done paying this. And then I remembered that that would affect my credit, so I kept paying it. <laughs> and then about 10 years in, I was like, this is just miserable. But before that, God gave Deborah a word and said, the debt has already been paid for. And I was like, hey, that's a powerful word. But you know what I did from that day till this day? I made that monthly payment. I'm like, God, you said the debt is paid for. What is going on here? And we're one week out from a testimony to be able to tell you what God has done in our life to give us 10 years back that we never thought would happen. And I'm telling you, it's not because of my persistence. It's because of my wife's persistence. It's because every day she woke up and submitted that to the Lord. It's because every day she got in there and submitted. She held on to that word. And she, I got tired, y'all. I just was like, we're going to pay it until 2028. Then we're going to roll that payment right into our kids' lives, okay? It's just going to be, it's going to come with us. We're not going to get a dog. We got student loan payments. That's our pet. But she was like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this to God. God said that it's been met, and I'm just going to give it to him, and we're going to do it. She had a persistence about her. She was shameless. And I, I think that we've got to get back to the secret place of the Almighty, and we've got to get on our knees, and we've got to begin to persistently give things to the Lord and persistently ask him for things. Somebody in the room is about to give up on their marriage, and I'm telling you, you've got to get in your prayer closet. You've got to get on your knees, and you've got to say, God, I need you to intervene in my marriage right now. Some of us need a job right now. We need to say, God, I need you to intervene right now in my job. I need jobs. I need careers. I need doors to open up, and we got to knock on those doors. Some of us have been praying for our kids for 20 years, and we're tired. And the enemy could begin to shame us and say, this is your fault that they're that way, regardless of whose fault it is. A shameless approach to God says, I have relational privilege to come boldly, and you better believe I'm going to come persistently, because I'm not going to move from this rock until that door is opened. What would our prayers look like? Oh, man. I tell you, I want to go deeper. 
I want my prayers to be like Jesus. I want a bold persistence to advance the kingdom of God and shrink back the gates of hell. I want to see our culture shift. I want to see our nation come to repentance. I want to see our world be set on fire with the revival. But it's only going to happen when God's people get persistent in prayer. Prayer and expectancy are the birthplace of revival. But here's how Jesus ends the lesson on prayer. If you look past this parable, uh, ultimately the guy opens the door and gives the man what he needs. And Jesus says later on, I tell you this, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. You knock and the door will be open to you. All of those words that he uses are verbs that are active tense verbs. It means that it's an ongoing process of asking. But you don't just ask hoping, you ask expectantly. You know, my daughter, Charlotte, is the most expectant, persistent, bold little asker I've ever met. You know what I'm talking about, parents? We can go to the restaurant and everybody can order what they want within reason because I pretty much control the menu. But the other day she ordered Mickey Mouse chocolate chip pancakes. That's a good meal. I was a little jealous. I had to be more responsible. I got two eggs, two bacon, two pancakes, two biscuits and gravy, a cup of coffee and orange juice and a cup of fruit. I got the fruit to settle it down. I didn't get all of that. I got two eggs and two bacon. And in the middle of the meal, all of a sudden, I just see her looking at me with her mouth open. I'm like, what? She's like, give me some eggs. I'm like, she's like, didn't we order eggs too? Dad, I ordered my meal and I ordered your meal. Like, what? you're not sharing with me. Dad, Jesus talks about sharing. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I said, girlfriend, I'm about to dump this syrup all over you. And she's like. I'm like, no, you eat your pancakes. And she's like, Dad, I want some eggs. I'm like, eat your pancakes. Dad, I want some eggs. Eat your pancakes. Dad, I want your eggs. Eat your pancakes. Now here, i got a full disclosure. I ordered the eggs for both of us. I'm going to give her the eggs. And, and my parents think I'm a pushover, and I probably am. But that's okay. I'm, I'm, con I'm content with who I am. But I enjoy the relationship. I enjoy hearing her say dad. I just enjoy that. Right? But she asks knowing I'm going to give in. I'm like, here's some eggs. Now let me eat my bacon. And she's like, we got bacon? <laughs> Man, this is a great meal. We stopped at the English muffin because you've got to draw a boundary somewhere. <laughs> There's an old proverb that says that it is only the boldness and expectancy of a child that would demand a cup of water from the king. Imagine if we had the attitude of a child and approached God as friend the expectancy that we could have in our prayer life. Knowing that if we ask, we will receive. If we seek, we will find. If we knock, the door will be open to us. So friend, have you stopped asking? Have you stopped seeking? And did your hand get sore? And so you stopped knocking. I asked it once, but how many prayers go unanswered because we simply stop asking? not because God is unwilling. Look at this quote from E.M. Bounds with me. It says, The possibilities of prayer are found in the illimitable promise, illimitable promise, the willingness and the power of God to answer prayer, to answer all prayer, to answer every prayer, and to supply fully the illimitable need of man. This is the power of prayer. It gives us access of all of God's riches, all of His goodness, and all of his glory. And he will in turn meet all of our needs. This is physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Some of us are dealing with some emotional pain right now that God wants to heal. We have to be persistent and bold in asking him to do so. There are some things in our life, maybe financially or physically, that God wants to do. But we have to get persistent and bold with our prayers but also come with expectancy, knowing that our expectations do much for the kingdom of God. There's this psychological babble word called 
the positive self expectancy. Meaning that if you expect yourself to succeed, most likely you're going to succeed. Now, I have a lot of issues with that. And I'm not here to prove or disprove or to debate that. So if you're going to send me emails about it, my email address is rgonzalez. <laughs> but I was reading this article and I was wondering, what if we had a positive God expectancy? What if we expected God with an optimism, a real optimism that God was going to come through for us in every season, in every circumstance, in every situation. Prayer gives us the ability to build up our expectation level, to remind our problems just how big our God is, to remind the enemy just how defeated he really is, and to remind ourselves that God deserves all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor due to his name. Did you know that Jeremiah 33.3 3 says, call unto me and I will answer and I will show you things that you do not know. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could think, we could ask, or we can imagine, be all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Now check it out. All that we can think, all that we can ask, and all that we can imagine. God is willing and able to do more. So if you can imagine it, God can multiply it. If you can think it, God won't just meet it, but He can do more than it. So what would our prayer life look like? And what needs are we facing right now that we could take this parable and we could have the boldness, the persistency, and the expectation of a friend coming at midnight, knocking on the door, asking God, God, I need some bread. God, I need some healing. God, I need some restoration. God, I need my marriage to be restored. God, I need my mental capacities to be restored. God, I need my relationship at work with my boss to be restored or with my uh, employees to be restored. God, I need my relationship with your church because I've been hurt by the church, God. I need that to be restored. And we came like a friend at midnight. What would happen in our life if we had positive God expectancy? We begin to imagine what God could do. And God didn't just show up and do that, but he did more. He did more. Church, will you close your eyes with me today? And I've asked a powerful question already. And really my goal today is just to encourage you and to motivate you, maybe to go a little deeper in your prayer life and approach God differently than just the routine of prayer, but maybe through the relationship of prayer. But I'm convinced that in a room of this size that there are needs that have gone unanswered, not because God is unwilling to answer, but because we have simply stopped asking. And I want to ask you, if you would have the boldness today, the audacious faith, the expectancy, to just right where you are, stand up and say, I'm going to begin to start asking again for my marriage, for my family, for my children, for my job, for my healing, for my health, for my peace. I'm just curious if there's just anybody in the room today that will stand with me and say, I'm going to start asking God again for some big things. I'm going to start asking God. I'm going to knock on the door till it hurts. I'm going to knock on the door till it opens. People standing up all over the room. Their prayer lives are going, are going deeper right now. The intensity level in their life is going deeper. And God is about to open the door to so much more. Let me pray over you and then we're all going to stand and close with a worship song. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are motivating and moving us now by the power of your Holy Spirit, knowing that if we ask, Lord, that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll receive. If we seek, we'll find. If we knock, the door will be open. God, give us the persistence, the boldness, and the expectancy to know that you are who you say you are. You're, you'll do what you say you'll do, that you're good on your promise every time. God, begin to stir us to deeper prayer. Awaken a revival in our lives so that we can know the fullness of the Holy Spirit and we can begin to see you open doors that we thought were closed long ago. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Will you stand and sing this with me?
Jesus. And I, I want to let you know that if you just need to agree with somebody in prayer, that you've stirred this need up or, or you're trying to waken your prayer life back up. And if you need to agree with somebody, we're going to have our prayer team leaders and, and our pastors up here available to pray with you and believe knowing that God is going to show up. I want you to know that next week we're going to have a great weekend as well. We have a guest speaker, Aaron Cole, is going to be here. He's from a church in Wisconsin. He serves on the convoy board. It's going to be a great time to be at Calvary. Bring your friend, and and God's going to show up in a real and powerful way. Please, this week, take your prayer life to a deeper level. Be bold in your relationship with God. Expect big things and be persistent. We'll see you next week. We're up here for prayer.